So, Beth, it would be interesting to just talk a little bit about COVID now, Mm -hmm. because what I thought to myself during COVID was I was reading about supermarket shelves, no stock and that sort of thing. And that suddenly people were bolt buying all sorts of not just toilet rolls, but alcohol. Mm -hmm. So then what they'd done is they'd moved that sort of social interaction and the alcohol associated with the pub or a meal into a different space. And it was their home. Do you think that's had an impact on what people were doing during that, at least that first lockdown, where everything was really quite scary in every type of Mm -hmm. world that you were in, whether you were working from home or whether you were looking after your children? Suddenly, there were a lot of constraints in our lives. Mm -hmm. So I did a study on this during during the pandemic, um, which was in partnership with the Department for Health and Social Care, which was really exciting to be able to deliver. And um, that demonstrated that there was a subset where COVID, the pandemic really did escalate alcohol use for, for a subset of older adults. Mm-hmm. So we did see an increase. I remember the AA saying that they'd had a 28% increase in calls. And then in the November, I remember Balance came out with um, a whole set of public health messages around, please watch how much you're drinking mm-hmm. because we've got more people in A&E with alcohol-induced problems, etc. Yeah. So it was about 32% of older people in Increase their drinking during the pandemic. It was particularly amongst the younger old, so people who might still be in, in employment, who were now working from home. Um, and it was kind of effectively like a pre-tirement. Um, they, they had fewer constraints on the drinking again. Um, they didn't have to get up in the morning so early. So if they had a few drinks the night before, then, then it didn't matter so much. When we're thinking about the older age group, we not, might not be thinking about the people who still in work, but um, that aspect of the pandemic did have a big impact. There was another subset, um, somewhere in the, about a fifth, um, actually reduced their drinking. That was people who recognised that their drinking might escalate during this really stressful time and actually kind of tried to buckle down on their health behaviour, make sure that they came through it as healthy as possible. I know when I was looking at the uh, literature for my work, there was an awful lot about uh, social isolation Mm -hmm. and feeling that you weren't connected anymore Mm -hmm. with your families, your friends, your parents, whatever it might be. And alcohol became a bit of a a prop Mm -hmm. to help you get through that. Alcohol could be something for for older adults where it was kind of a pleasure that they still had in their day. Um, But also for some, it became a bit of a coping mechanism. It was an escape from such a stressful and traumatic part of of some people's lives. Then there were the people who were digitally excluded. Mm -hmm. And they're a really important part of our population. At least 30% are digitally excluded. It doesn't matter where you live in the UK. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's a really important thing. So if you couldn't actually do the WhatsApp, do the Zoom calls, Mm -hmm. um, do the Teams calls, whatever it might be, you couldn't video conference. You really lost that connection with people. Mm -hmm. And you became, you buckled down on your own, but essentially you lost some of your inhibitions because Mm -hmm. you were on your own. Mm -hmm. And there was nobody to see you. Yeah. 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 You know, so even if you went out in the garden, they might only see you for five minutes for a chat across the fence and that might be it. Yeah. So, you know, the rest of the time you were on your own. Yeah. And you only had yourself to answer to, I guess, in in those circumstances, definitely. If you then look at that with the mental health issues around anxiety, depression, low Mm -hmm. mood, particularly around the winter, when one minute we all thought we could meet up for Christmas, and the next minute that was just removed from us. So I think alcohol dependency was seen to have increased, Mm -hmm. and a lot of people did try dry January, but Mm -hmm. really didn't get through it. So not everybody um, um, was negatively affected in terms of their mental health during the pandemic, and in fact some people kind of flourished. But um, it obviously was also a very, very stressful time, particularly for older adults who in the UK were highlighted as a vulnerable group um, by by the media, which probably, I mean, I I know it caused quite a lot of of distress among some some older adults. We saw older adults drinking as a coping mechanism for the first time in their lives, um, which... I mean, to me, it was very, very surprising, but it just it just goes to show how the things that we face in our lives as we as we get older, particularly, um, can become such a, a trigger for drinking in the context of mental health problems and as a coping mechanism. Is there anything you found out in other research that you've done around that subject, our mental health and well-being and whether or not there's a relationship between alcohol 
and our mood, uh, perhaps low mood and negative sort of connotations about life and lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I would say is that harmful alcohol use is often symptomatic of, it, it's kind of like a symptom of, of experiencing mental health concerns, of kind of having a negative headspace. It can be, um, for some people, um, it, it can become a coping mechanism, it can become an escape from those negative feelings. And we know, I mean, everybody recognises, I'm sure, that in the short term, for most of us, alcohol has a, positively, a positive impact on our mood. Um, but what people don't really realise often is that in the medium and the longer term, it's actually very detrimental to our mental health. And it can really become a vicious cycle um, for some people who may be drinking at more harmful levels, um, where their alcohol intake is negatively impacting their mood and they're managing their mood with their alcohol intake. And often um, for the older adults that, that are, we're working with in, in alcohol services, um, it has become a vicious spiral and it has resulted in kind of quite ingrained drinking habits in the context of negative mental health. It's a difficult one to manage because it's kind of like, which do you treat first? And it's and, and the answer is you need to treat them both together. But often we don't have that joint up working in, in health services. So in terms of developing services. I mean, I know we have a recovery and treatment centre here in, uh, well, I say Newcastle, but it's part of CNTW, isn't it? Mm -hmm. At the moment, what you're talking about is people being segmented mm -hmm. into, well, we'll look at the mental health problem and you'll look at this yeah. alcohol problem. And that's something that I'm working on at the moment um, with my project for the Applied Research Collaboration um, in the North East North Cumbria, uh, where we're looking to understand better the lived experience of older people who have um, co-occurring alcohol and mental health problems and think about what holistic and integrated and tailored support for older adults with these um, co-occurring conditions might look like, um, which I think is particularly important for the older age group. And what you're looking for is this sort of holistic approach yeah. to helping and supporting people. So they've got that issue around having these co-occurring conditions where often um, they are excluded from mental health services because they're expected to manage their drinking um, initially. but how can you take away something that's a coping mechanism for somebody while they're working on their mental health? So you kind of have to be combating those holistically and, and together. Um, but we also have to think about um, particular barriers that older adults might have to accessing services. Um, we know that mobility issues, um, things like hearing difficulties um, can be more common amongst the older age group um, and accessing for example if a service is up the stairs, um, if a service is provided over the phone as it often was during the Covid pandemic, uh, it can it can be a real barrier for older adults in, in engaging with, with those services. So um, at the moment yeah trying to work on um, making services more accessible and more holistic in addressing um, alcohol use in the context of mental health problems for older people. How far do you think the research that you do can influence the change in how services, you know, which are pretty embedded within the NHS, can change? We're really lucky um, in having the funding and the support from the uh, Applied um, Research Collaboration uh, in that they really do facilitate working in partnership uh, with those local organisations um, in, in, in our region um, and this project's being delivered in partnership with the uh, Integrated Care Service for the North East North Cumbria um, and also in collaboration with a number of alcohol and mental health services um, in, in the North East North Cumbria as well. Um, which hopefully should enable us to um, come up with more impactful um, ideas around um, around how to make things better and more joined up. The project's completely in response to a group of, uh, we call them patient and public involvement contributors, but really it's service users that I worked with at Drinkwise Age Well, who have um, lived experience of co-occurring alcohol and mental health problems, and this was really their project that they wanted wanted to deliver on. We're also working in the context of the community uh, mental health framework for adults and older adults, which is um, kind of highlights that more joint up working and that we need to be addressing um, people with mental health problems and alcohol problems like more holistically. Um, so we've got that kind of focus at the same time as these integrated care systems being set up. Yeah, I think I, I, it's really interesting to hear all of that because what I say to myself is that 
it's really good if people can understand that research can be translated into practice. Yeah. It can make a difference to how services are delivered and will make a difference to what's going on in the North East. Mm-hmm. And the way that we've approached this project as well is looking at designing new initiatives um, with the input of practitioners, of commissioners, people who themselves are older and have co-occurring alcohol mental and mental health problems, and thinking about what better support could look like and what's feasible to deliver, um, and hopefully looking at uh, conducting a pilot so that we are actually implementing new approaches and getting evidence for new approaches through our work, which is really exciting. So I think that's a really nice note to end it on mm-hmm. because it's a really positive note mm-hmm. about how we can make a difference to our local population. Thank you. It's been really great chatting, Kate. Thank you.